Well, good morning. Obviously, it is not Sunday, but as I'm filming this, it is actually Friday. And I wanted to come to you from just a little bit of a different setting today and to do something a little bit different. And it's a beautiful, gorgeous autumn day. And I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to share that with you as we break into God's Word and study God's Word together. We are still in the unit after God's own heart. And today we're going to be looking at the topic of honor marriage. And that comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, which you know as the seventh of the Ten Commandments. And so I wanted to just open up with that very commandment and just read that to you. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 says, very simply, you shall not commit adultery. Um, I wanted to break that down a little bit because even though it's a tiny, short, little sentence, it is a very crucial, crucial commandment, and it is something that is extremely important for us to understand. And I want you to also realize that the Bible is so rich and so deep. When you have studied it and you think you have exhausted your ability to absorb whatever you're gleaning from whatever scripture you're reading, you've just scratched the surface. And so one of the things that is very important for us to understand here as we study this is that there are two different aspects biblically to adultery. There is the sexual adultery, and that's what you usually hear preachers preach against, but there's also spiritual adultery or apostasy. And so I want you to realize that when you study this and you, re and you um, delve into what God is trying to teach us with thou shalt not commit adultery, there is more to it than just the sexual aspect. And so I want you to consider the word here that is rendered adultery. It is the Hebrew word, and it literally just means to commit adultery. But what does that mean? Well, we know committing adultery as uh, being sexually involved with someone to whom you are not married, uh, particularly when you are married or the other person is married. That's how they designate adultery uh, as being different from fornication. But there is the figurative meaning to this Hebrew word, which means to apostatize. And that just is a big word that just means what I told you a moment ago, apostasy. And to apostatize literally means to reject or abandon one's religion. You've heard uh, a lot of Bible scholars and preachers and teachers over the years talk about the age of apostasy, which is something that people believe we may actually be in, but that certainly will be a hallmark of the last days, where the church simply goes along with the things of the world and abandons its very fundamental religious faith, its fundamental beliefs in the Bible. Um, I personally think that we are living in that age of apostasy. Uh, and that just comes from the fact that when you teach God's Word and you teach it in depth, the reality is we don't draw a crowd that way. And so I want you to consider that when God said, do not commit adultery, you shall not commit adultery, there is the sexual aspect of it because the adultery harms and uh, disturbs the marriage setting, the marriage vow, but you also must take into account that God often uses marriage as a way of explaining his relationship to us. In fact, we as the church are referred to as the bride of Christ, are we not? Now as a man, that sometimes sounds a little strange coming off my lips talking about myself as the bride of Christ. But see, Christ is not using it in the sexual aspect of it. He's not talking about a physical sexual consummation. What he's talking about is that very union, that, uh, that union that cannot be dissolved. I can't say the word, forgive me. But... Uh, a union that cannot be broken. 
uh, where two become one. And so marriage for humans is very much a picture of how God chooses and wants to relate to us. And so there's a great spiritual aspect to marriage. I want you to consider some things from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. If you have your Bible, look with me in Jeremiah chapter 3. Because Jeremiah was one of God's prophets who was called to speak to God's people and to basically accuse them of spiritual adultery. And as you might imagine, it did not make him very popular because he had to say some things that, quite frankly, they just did not want to hear. And so I want to read some of those things to you because this is really critical to understanding what spiritual adultery means. In chapter 3 of Jeremiah, in verse 8, he's writing this uh, on behalf of God. He says, I gave faithless Israel. In other words, it's not Jeremiah who did this for Israel. This is God saying, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. In other words, he's talking about the exile. I spit them out of the Holy Land. He is calling it a certificate of divorce. He's saying, I broke this union and I sent her away because she was unfaithful to me. And so he goes on to say, Yet I saw that unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. So he is explaining to us that even though he punished Israel, the northern kingdom, for her spiritual uh, idolatry, her spiritual adultery, Judah didn't learn any lessons from it. And, and he is lamenting that and this is a sad sad thing in fact jeremiah goes on to say in the next verse that israel committed adultery with stone and wood what does he mean they literally carved idols now remember what we talked about with paul and his teaching in romans where he explained to us that the world's biggest problem is not recognizing the sovereignty of god knowing that God is real, and that's one of the reasons I like being out here in the woods behind my house, because this is as close as you can get to just absorbing God's creation and his creative power as I can find here close to home. And so Paul was teaching us that even though creation itself shows us that there is a God, he has always existed, he is eternal, he is all-powerful and he's divine. He's perfect. Remember that? Even though all the world can recognize that from just what they see, they choose instead to worship the created things. They worship things that God created instead of worshiping God the Creator. Now Israel even took it to another level by carving things, inanimate things. I mean they weren't even they weren't even um, worshiping the, the true original creations of God, the animals and humans. They were taking inanimate things like wood and stone and carving it into something and saying, that's a God. Now, our God, our loving Father, is quite offended by that. So where are we going with all this? I want us to keep some things in mind. All of the commandments all of this list of Ten Commandments, every bit of what we learn in the Ten Commandments hinges on the very first one. You shall have no other gods before me. When we learn to properly relate to God, to keep our proper frame of who God is and why He's worthy of our worship and why He has to be number one, then all of the other things, all of our other relationships become easier to navigate. In other words, this is why when Christ spoke to wives and he said that, uh, excuse me, when Paul was writing this uh, and he was saying that wives must submit to their husbands, but he also said, but husbands, you have to submit to Christ.
you have to let Christ be number one in your life. And so if I want to honor my marriage, I have to first honor God. Humanly, I cannot truly honor my marriage properly if I don't have the right relationship with God. If I don't understand the sovereignty of God, if I don't understand the blessings of, of what God has done for me, the salvation that he has delivered to me through Jesus Christ, if I don't put those things first in my life and understand those and honor those, I'm probably not going to do a good job with my wife and my family either. So I want you to consider that marriage becomes very much a picture of the relationship that God wants with humans. Uh, and it is a beautiful picture. Jeremiah, let's go back to Jeremiah in chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, and I want to read verses 7 and 8 in Jeremiah chapter 5. Here God is speaking again, and he says, uh, again, some pretty harsh words. Why should I forgive you? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by gods that are not gods. I supplied all their needs, yet they committed adultery and thronged to the houses of prostitutes. They are well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for another man's wife. Should I not punish them for this? What is God saying? He's saying, Israel, your kids don't love me. Your kids are selfish sexually greedy, especially your young men. They are looking for anything and everything and even will um, defile themselves with a prostitute. And so God is saying this is not the problem, this is a symptom. It is a problem because obviously prostitution, fornication, these are all sexual sins that the Bible strictly uh, does not like, <laughs> let me put it lightly there, but what God is also saying is the root here is your relationship with me is all broken. So therefore your relationship with other people is broken. And so this is why marriage is such a, uh, such a really important and vital way of understanding how we relate to God. Because again, remember what we talked about with Paul's teaching in Ephesians, that you need to uh, first address the sins of your actions, which in this particular case was prostitution, fornication, adultery, okay? But then you need to let the Holy Spirit change the way you think and to begin to go deeper within you and look at the sins of motive, your attitudes. Why? Why are you chasing after your neighbor's wife? Why are you chasing after prostitutes? Well, the reason, according to Jeremiah, according to God, is because they don't have the right relationship with God Almighty. And so this is why I say all of the, all of the commandments hinge on number one. You absolutely have to put God first. And when you put God first, then the other things become much easier to deal with and much easier, I don't mean to deal with, I mean much easier to navigate, much easier uh, to adhere to, to abide to, uh, to even enjoy because when you follow the commandments of God, it brings a lot of freedom into your life. Some people tend to think of these as God just looking down on humans with this big stick and saying, you better do this and you better do that. God is not being this mean old bully up in heaven. God realizes we need boundaries within our lives. He realizes that we're gonna be a lot happier uh, spiritually, emotionally, socially, sexually, if we follow his plan because his plan protects us. It guards us. It puts a boundary and a hedge around us. And so I want us to keep in mind some other things um, when we talk about uh, adultery, uh, the inevitably people say, but what about in the Old Testament when men had multiple wives? Well, the Jewish law, not the law that was given by God, but the law that they put together themselves, 
did not strictly prohibit having more than one wife. The Bible gave lots of warnings about it, uh, and particularly um, God spoke some pretty pretty deep words to Israel about their kings and explain to them your kings don't need to have lots of wives because that's what kings did back then that was one way that a king could display his wealth and his power was not just by the size of his army or the size of his kingdom but how many concubines and how many wives he had and God spoke to Israel and said please don't follow this pattern it's going to tear your kingdom apart. It's going to cause your kings to have misguided and divided loyalties. And we saw that with all of the kings, but particularly Solomon. Solomon took on so many wives, and Solomon began to not only take on wives, but allow their pagan religion to come into Israel and even build temples to some of their pagan gods. And so the Bible was always warning us. If you want to look at another case uh, where having more than one wife uh, was probably not the best uh, idea, just look at Abraham. I mean, um, when you consider the conflict that we still deal with in the Middle East today, it all goes back to the roots of Isaac versus Ishmael because Abraham had kids by more than one wife and there were problems because of that. So within the context of marriage, God didn't really give us this option of marriage can be whatever you want it to be. It's sad that as we look at our society today, there is such an attempt to change and redefine marriage and make it whatever anybody wants it to be. And so I felt like if we're going to talk about honoring marriage, we needed to figure out how do we define it? How do we define, how do we determine what constitutes marriage? So there are three things. Um, the first one is strictly physical union, the sexual consummation of a relationship. Um, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul was explaining to some of these men who were getting involved with prostitutes, and he was saying, do you not realize that when you have sex with a prostitute, you become one flesh with this person? And so uh, Paul was reiterating something that goes all the way back to Genesis when God said that a, a man would leave his father and mother and he would cleave unto his wife. Um, you read about the sexual union uh, as making two become one. And Paul was explaining that in its strictest terms, Marriage could almost be boiled down to that physical union. Um, and in many cultures across human history, that has sometimes been all that was required, was that you took a wife and you consummated the relationship and she was your wife and nothing else was required. Um, there's a second thing, however, that we tend to find in most of human history, and that is a declaration of intent. So there is a physical union, but also a declaration of intent. Well, what does that mean? That's strictly speaking, that's the wedding ceremony. The declaration of intent, um, let me go and, and just use the example of my wife and myself. We've been married for 32 years. so. Uh, when we had a wedding ceremony, that was a public ceremony, and that was essentially our declaration of intent. This was saying, we're going to take responsibility for one another. We're going to make vows to each other. We 
had and required some credible witnesses around us to attest to the fact that we have publicly declared our intent to be married, to be a married couple, an exclusive couple. And that uh, declaration of intent also makes other relationships secondary. Just like God said that a man would leave his father and mother, it doesn't mean he forsakes them, but it means that you break off from this family unit and you go and you begin a new family unit in a new union. And so the declaration of intent is the second way that we describe or define marriage. There is a third, and this is the one that we unfortunately put too much credibility into, and that is the legal uh, declaration. That's simply the government saying, yes, we recognize that this is a legal marriage. We recognize John and Angela are now husband and wife. That's why when the preacher marries you, and he usually says something like, you know, by the power vested in me, by the state of Tennessee, Kentucky, Nevada, whatever state you're in, what he's saying is the state, the government, has given me the authority to declare that this is a legal wedding, a legal marriage. It really isn't until the marriage certificate is carried back to the courthouse, put on record, and basically then the government says, yes, you are legally married. So there are three ways that we constitute marriage. Now, why do I say we put too much weight on the legal aspect of it. Legal marriage is vital and important. I certainly want to be legally married, okay, but I am more concerned with how God views my marriage than I am how Tennessee views my marriage. Does that make sense? I, um, I don't like the way that our government, the way our country, our states, are trying to redefine marriage. I mean, there are places where uh, some states in this country where people are literally marrying their biological children. There are efforts undergone in different states to lower the age of consent so that grown people can marry 14-year-olds and 12-year-olds if they choose to. There are people who want to be able to legally marry their dog or their cat. There's even one man who has gone to court to try and make sure that he can be legally married to his car. Now, as a citizen, those things bother and upset me. As a Christian, however, I have to put those aside. I cannot change what the state does. I can vote and be active and try to be involved in electing people who have some common sense about them. But other than that, I really can't control what the state, what the government does. Okay? So I have to sort of separate those things. The, the state can determine what marriage is. Unfortunately, there's not much I can do to stop that. I am more concerned with what does God say marriage is. And so that's why I wanted to look at what it means when I say that marriage is a picture of our relationship with God. I want to get really personal with you and I, I ask your forgiveness for it because I'm always telling these personal stories, but it's just the best way that I know how to relate the things uh, that God has taught to me. Um, I am physically joined with Christ at my conversion. There are some correlations between these three things that constitute marriage and these three things that I'm about to list to you that, that constitute my relationship with God. And that physical union, yes, I was physically joined with Christ at my conversion at nine years old. Now, 
nothing sexual, no sexual connotation in that physical union. But I want you to understand that salvation is an invasive procedure whereby the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, literally comes and dwells within my very soul. I um, recently watched a YouTube video, a long video, it was about two hours, um, of an open heart surgery. It was the exact same procedure that I had done back in December. And uh, my wife was sitting there beside me and she said, are you crazy? Why do you want to watch that? That's gory. And I said, I want to see what happened to me. I want to know exactly what was done to me. What did I experience? Because I slept through it. <laughs> and so I was fascinated because through this whole surgical procedure and this whole video, the surgeon, it was a teaching video, and so the surgeon was explaining everything that he was doing and showing you, and if you're, if you're squeamish, you couldn't watch it, okay? Live surgery here. But here's what really touched me about it. The surgeon, at one point, for a good little while actually, literally held the patient's heart in his hands. He went into that patient's body in a place that we're not supposed to actually go. And I was very touched by the trust factor. The patient was completely out of control in this situation. So let me explain a little bit more what I'm saying about that. The patient did not go to the doctor and say, here's what's wrong with me. Uh, these are the problems that I have, and here's what you need to do to fix it, and let's, let's do this. No. The patient was probably like me. Went to the doctor, something's wrong, help me. The doctor figures out what's wrong. The doctor tells me what's wrong. The doctor schedules a surgery, and I submit myself to that, and that's what that patient had done. He totally submitted himself to the whole process. He submitted and surrendered himself to the surgeon. And he's unconscious, he's laid out on the table and completely out of control. He has no control of what's happening to him. He is trusting that surgeon with his very heart, with his very life. And so I thought that is exactly what salvation is like because I didn't go to Jesus and say, okay, look, I've got a sin problem, Jesus. Here's what you need to do. Uh, let's do this right now. <laughs> No, the Holy Spirit said, you've got a sin problem. You need a Savior. You need Jesus. And the salvation process only happened because I was willing to surrender myself to the great physician and let him invade. And he didn't go into my physical heart. He didn't go into my actual chest cavity. But my soul, which is even more profound. So that's why I say salvation is in no way to be looked at as just a decision that I made or something that I did uh, that hopefully will get me to heaven. Salvation is me surrendering to this process and letting Jesus Christ do what he can do. Um, and that physically uh, binds me to Jesus Christ in a way that I think a lot of us Christians don't really appreciate. But then there's a second aspect to it. I declare my public intent with my baptism. Now, I think that, unfortunately, baptism has been watered down some in our generation. Um, go back to the, the early church. Go back to the early converts, the early Christians. Go back to that time when Christianity was being attacked and assaulted as a crazy cult with this crazy Jesus guy that they say was resurrected. Back then, when you were baptized, you were baptized in a public place 
anybody and everybody could see it and know, and you were publicly telling everybody, I now am identifying myself with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all other relationships are secondary and I have credible witnesses. So I think of our baptism as that declaration of intent. It is first and foremost my very first opportunity of obedience to Christ to be baptized. But it also is a public declaration of intent so that everybody knows and there are credible witnesses and I have a certificate even that says, yes, on this date we witnessed that John R. Gators did credibly submit himself to Jesus Christ. And so there is then a third thing. I am legally bound by church membership. And unfortunately, I think we take church membership and uh, make light of that as well because uh, the Bible doesn't say that you have to be a member of the church to be saved. Um, why do I even bother? Well, the Bible didn't say that I have to be um, sanctioned by the state of Tennessee to be married to my wife because the state of Tennessee did not exist when the Bible was written. But God does honor us when we obey the rules, the laws. Remember from uh, the last couple of weeks, it was God himself who instituted human government. And so he even said to people who ask about uh, paying taxes to Caesar, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto me what is mine. Uh, God does not expect us to be bad citizens uh, and to be rebels and, 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 and go off on our own and do what we want to do. He expects us to live within the rules and the guidelines that are brought about by the government. And so God does recognize and honor legal marriage. And I believe that God also does recognize and honor when we come and we join legally, if you want to use that term, with a local body and say, we're part of this group. We're connected. We're now um, joining ourselves with this particular fellowship of people. And so when I look at my salvation, I see all of these different aspects that are so similar to marriage. And then you begin to understand why spiritual adultery is such a big deal to God. So how do I honor marriage? Well, the simplest way is honor God. Absolutely honor God above everything else. Love Him, put Him first, trust Him. If you are not a Christian, if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, pray, talk to God about that. Um, ask Him for some answers. It's no different than going to the doctor and saying, hey, something's not right here. Can you help me? Simply ask God for some help. He will help you. But to honor marriage, honor God. Honor the relationships that are around you. Honor your church. Honor that relationship that Jesus Christ has established with you as a believer. And then it will be much easier for you to honor your wife or your husband to put that person above all the other people in your life. I ask you if you would pray with me. Our Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace. You are infinitely too good for us, Lord, too good to us. You do so much for us and we certainly don't deserve it. And Father, just like Pastor said Wednesday night, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We know we don't deserve either and yet you pour them out on us in such abundance. You have given us marriage, Lord, as a beautiful, beautiful picture of what it's like to have a relationship with you as a way of uh, bringing a little bit of that heavenly type of relationship down here to this earth and to enjoy it while we're here. 
And so, dear God, I pray that you would help us to honor our marriages. I pray if there are those who are watching who are struggling in their marriage, Lord, that you would bring some freshness into that, that you would bring some truth and some healing, Lord, and I pray that you would bring some refreshed commitment. Lord, we also just ask that you would help us to have a refreshed commitment to you, Father, to what you've called us to do. We love you and we thank you for all that you've given us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining me out here under this beautiful, beautiful canopy of God's green trees. Uh, love you and I thank you and look forward to seeing you again next Sunday.